Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started, so if everybody can uh, take their seats. This is a full house this morning. So I want to start by, um, my, my name is Victoria McCullough. Uh, I work in the Office of Public Engagement. Um, hopefully we'll get a chance to tell you a little bit more about what our office does. But the main function is, is really uh, bringing um, as many folks to the White House to give you an opportunity um, to engage with us, policymakers, um, folks across the administ administration, and then hopefully connect with each other. Um, I think particularly for this group, um, it's special um, because you guys are kind of coming from all over, and it's not often that we get such a, a really awesome and, and very like powerful group of people um, for a day like this. So we're really excited here at the White House. Um, I want to do like a couple of housekeeping things. I think most of you are probably there. You saw that coffee and pastries and breakfast were outside. Um, please, please, like we use this facility, like this South Court Auditorium, all the time. So they're very funny about making sure we keep it clean. So no, uh, no coffee in here, no food. Um, so just please be mindful of that. And then uh, I think you guys found, hopefully you f saw the restrooms as you were coming in, but if you didn't, if you walk out here uh, and then to the, uh, for the men right to the left as you go through the double doors, just walk out here to the left. And then for the women's, it's just upstairs, um, just above the men. So um, that's where the facilities are. Um, I think that covers it. So we'll, um, we're excited to have you here today. Um, we're, uh, we're hopefully, I think everybody's kind of making their way in, but it'll be, it will be a full house. So a couple things um, about the day is we're going to have, uh, we're going to have a couple of hours this morning um, where uh, hopefully giving you an opportunity to really interact with um, folks here at the administration, including someone very, who is very special uh, here uh, at the White House, um, but also has a really deep uh, and long relationship with AmeriCorps. Um, and that's Jack Lou, and he'll actually be here in a few minutes to get us started. Um, the hope is that this is a day uh, that you are interactive and as honest as possible. Uh, we're, our hope is that when you come in that you engage with us in such a way that it's uh, productive and, and uh, constructive for you, but also for us. So I encourage you to ask questions and to really feel comfortable, um, and we want to be um, we just want to be as, uh, as honest and, and uh, hopefully provide you with um, answers to a lot of your questions or an opportunity for you to provide feedback. So I encourage everyone here today uh, to, uh, to take that in mind as, you, uh, as we do the briefing this morning and you get an opportunity um, to ask questions. But also moving into the lunch break, we're also going to have an opportunity for more smaller breakout conversations. Um, and that's really a place where our hope is that you uh, feel comfortable and feel like it's an opportunity to engage on an issue that you really care about, um, but also maybe some policy areas that you're not familiar with. Um, so that's, uh, that's something uh, that we, we were really careful and thoughtful about as we were pulling it together. And then at the end of the day, actually this is uh, probably our, our favorite part, but we have the White House Champions of Change program, which we actually started a year and a half ago. Um, ironically enough, now that I think about it, it I think our, one of our first ones was Peace Corps alumni. Um, so we're excited to have kind of come to this point. Uh, today we're actually getting an opportunity to honor AmeriCorps alumni as White House Champions of Change. Um, and it's a story, you guys have a, a really, really powerful story uh, to tell. And our hope is really through this program and through honoring these champions that it's, uh, it's an opportunity to lift that story up. Um, so we're excited that you guys are here today and, um, and very appreciative of, of you taking the time to come in and then hope today is, uh, is, is successful and an opportunity to make a new friend um, either here at the White House or with each other. So I encourage you to take the time to, to also get to know each other throughout the day. So um, with that, I'm going to actually, um, we're going to, is Ben, did Ben make it in? Did he get stuck outside? I think we had a couple of issues outside. He is, did he make it in? He hasn't? Is there anything else I'm missing, Patricia, on the, I want to make sure that I'm covering everything that Ben would have covered. We'll get, you'll get to, yeah, do you have anything? This is Patricia Bory from CNCS who may have a couple of things, housekeeping things I might have missed. And then we'll have, uh, we'll have Jack come up. Hi, everyone. How are you, do, how are you guys doing? Good. So Ben Duda, the executive director of AmeriCorps alums, is outside making sure the last folks get in the building. So he'll be uh, speaking with you guys momentarily. 
But this is, this is really amazing. Um, I work at the Corporation for National Community Service. I was also an AmeriCorps alumni with the NCCC for two years and worked out in the field for 10 with a, with a program as well. So it is amazing to be here with, with all of you. Um, we wanted to just find out, we have, I think we have 25 states represented in the room. Um, so it's, it's really awesome to, to have you all here. Um, how many folks participated in an NCCC program? Very nice. And how many folks uh, participated in AmeriCorps VISTA? All right. We have Mary Strausser here, um, the director of, of uh, AmeriCorps VISTA. And how many people uh, participated in AmeriCorps state program? That's awesome. And we have uh, Bill Basil, who is our new director of AmeriCorps, who you all will hear from, hear from later. So, um, so we are... Um, really excited that you all are here. We have 12 champions that we have selected uh, that you all will hear from uh, this afternoon. We have a panel. Uh, there will be two panels that, uh, that they'll be speaking on. And um, you are gonna be able to hear some of your stories um, embedded in, in these champion stories. Um, so, um, we're excited that you guys will be able to interact with them. And um, in a minute, you're also going to hear from Wendy Spencer, our new CEO of the Corporation for National Community Service, who is going to work with you guys and figure out a little bit more of who is in, who is in the room. Um, so we are glad you're here. We also have um, Matt McCabe, who is a new board member with the Corporation um, for National Community Service, who is also a TFA member. Um, so, um, so welcome to everyone. And um, with that, I would like to introduce our CEO, our new CEO of the Corporation for National and Community Service, uh, Wendy Spencer. Hello, everyone. Wow. We're, we are at the White House. This is fantastic. Alums in the house, right? I love it. And the social media around this is just fantastic. Um, folks, if you're not following me on Twitter, please do, at Wendy, at Wendy CNCS, so please do that. Um, and my goal is to hit 1,000. I hit that about a week ago, so um, help me get to 2,000. But uh, I'm really excited to be here. and. We've, you know, this is, what's so great about this opportunity, I've done, I've only been on board four months. Um, it is the best job in America. I absolutely am having a blast uh, going around the country, telling your stories from the work that you did as uh, AmeriCorps members, um, and also our wonderful, wonderful uh, senior corps participants, VISTA, RSVP, foster grandparents, senior companions. I mean, it's just a, a great, and now we have the Social Innovation Fund which is fantastic, doing some wonderful work. But I've had the opportunity to come here and do a couple of the roundtables and days at the White House. And I have to tell you something. I don't know how you all have cracked the code, but you all have not one, not two, but about five White House senior officials here coming today. I mean, Jack Lou is about to walk in the, in the building, and I'll introduce him as soon as he gets here. Um, we've got Jonathan Greenblatt, I think, was here a minute ago. I don't know if John, Jonathan's still around or not. But uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, you'll have an opportunity to see uh, today. John Carson, the Office of Public Engagement, you're going to be able to hear from. You met Victoria. She's, she's uh, busy working behind the scenes. Um, and you're also going to meet a uh, uh, wonderful uh, gentleman working in the digital community, Macon. So, which is where my two boys were born from. I love the fact that his name is Macon, but uh, in Macon, Georgia. Anybody from Georgia here? Yay, shout out for Georgia. I know, you thought I was from Maine, didn't you? <laughs> I'm not, I'm from Georgia. But anyway, <laughs> um, I, it's really, I don't know how that happened, but I think it must be the spirit of AmeriCorps alums that got the, the attention of these wonderful leaders in the White House, so congrats to everybody. You had a wonderful photo this morning. We're, I hope that's already being streamed out and is uh, on social media and has been tweeted already. But uh, it's, uh, it's really gonna be a special day and I thank you first 
for your service as an AmeriCorps member, and I thank you for your continued service in the communities that you're serving in, in all the wonderful, wonderful ways in your careers and your volunteer service you're doing. It, it, I have read so many bios of people who are here today, and I am very actually humbled when I read these bios to see uh, the work that's, that's going on, that you, the leadership roles you're, you're placing, you're doing in your communities, it's phenomenal. So you are a select group that has uh, been invited here of 775,000 AmeriCorps alums. Woo Big shout out, right? Around the country. And this statistic I didn't know about um, until yesterday, that since 1994, the 775,000 AmeriCorps members served one billion, that's with a B, one billion hours of service. That is staggering. I can't even quite comprehend how much that is. But to think about the good that came from that service that actually is, is multiplying itself all throughout the country as alums is just, which we can't even measure. Uh, you know, we need to try to figure out that. But it's not just the hours of service. It's the impact that you had in your service when you were serving um, in, in your, uh, whether it was a VISTA or AmeriCorps um, alum program, state and national, or an NCCC program. Um, that's woohoo for NCCC, yes. Yes, we've got some NCCC alums here, love that. So it's really that impact. Um, the billion hours is staggering, but it's what happened. It's how children's lives were changed. It's how our environment was impacted. It's the opportunities in healthy futures, the economic opportunities that you as a, as a group, as a, as a movement, um, helped make during your service and the stories that you have to tell about that. I'm going to do some interactive work um, in, in a minute, but I want to do... Um, either before or after Jack Lou comes, so I'm going to stop everything when he walks in the room. But, um, but I want to share a couple of things. Um, we have a wonderful uh, board. Uh, our board is uh, nominated by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. And we have a wonderful board of 12 members now, and one of them we are so proud is in the room, and that is Matt McKay, an AmeriCorps alum from Teach for America. Welcome, Matt. So glad to have you here. Matt is going to be a part of our day-to-day, -day, uh, introducing uh, some of our champions of change and also leading a session, so I'm anxious to hear a Matt, uh, Matt session uh, later on in the day uh, after the noon hour. So Matt is a wonderful leader in Chicago, uh, a teacher. Thank you, Matt. We need more male teachers. I'm always on a recruiting male teachers. I just think we, you know, we, I, love, I love women teachers, but I love, we've got to have more men teaching too. But, uh, but so I thank you for that. But um, we also, I wanted to uh, thank the team that I have at the Corporation for National and Community Service who many are AmeriCorps alums. It is a true uh, mission environment, uh, service above self environment at our headquarters and across the country where we have state offices all over the country and states uh, that are there to serve uh, and, and work with states' needs and be sort of our presence on the local level. And uh, we've got, I would like all of our team to stand and raise your hands that uh, are here with us today from the corporation's office. Please stand and so we can thank everyone. Thank you so much. Great team. Awesome. Thank you. And so many of you, most of them, are AmeriCorps alums that are here today which is really, really exciting. And it really does, folks that come into our, into our space and work with us who um, are not AmeriCorps alums, but you know, they're here for, they love the service, they've been exposed to one way, they say, wow, this is really a unique place to work. Everybody's got the bug here, don't they? So, uh, so it is a really special place. Are we fortunate to have uh, the man of the hour here? Wonderful. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share some other thanks in a minute, but I want to set the stage uh, and remind uh, you how fortunate we are to have the Chief of Staff to the President of the United States of America, Jack Lew, with us today, who helped create the authorization for AmeriCorps and the Corporation for National and Community Service in the early days when that was being authorized and written. He took part in that. And we are for, so uh, forever grateful because of what it has yielded, all of the great work that 
you did around the country and the great work that continues today. Um, before he was Chief of Staff, he was the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, one of the most important positions in America, and we are so glad to have an amazing supporter, fan, and champion of national service. Could not get any better from the, one of the highest levels in the United States. So welcome, please, Jack Lou. Thanks, Wendy, and uh, AmeriCorps alum, welcome to the White House. Uh, I'm actually not just here, I'm thrilled to be here, I'm thrilled to see City Year Jackets, I'm thrilled to see all of you not just having been through AmeriCorps, but here and working to make it something that young Americans going forward will have as an option in their futures as well. It uh, is a source of uh, great pride as I look out at a room full of real champions of service who have gone into AmeriCorps, come out of AmeriCorps, remain committed to working to make our communities better, to give back to our communities, to have all of the ties between us, each other, and our communities that national service helps to build. Um, I'm extremely proud that in the Clinton administration, I was able to play a role in helping to create AmeriCorps. I was extremely proud to be there with President Obama and Senator Kennedy when they signed legislation to expand AmeriCorps. And we have managed through many, many years of difficult budget uh, battles to make sure that AmeriCorps survives. I think one of the things that we had in mind in the mid-1990s, it seemed like a bit of a pipe dream at the time, but that at a point like now, we'd have a room like this with people who had not just been in AmeriCorps, but who believed in it, who became the advocates for it, the way Peace Corps volunteers became the advocates for the Peace Corps. There was a theory, and the theory was that while it was an idea, people, people could be against it, but when it became a reality, um, it was going to have the kind of broad support that the Peace Corps has had, enduring support. I actually think we're there. I think if you look at the debates that we have about AmeriCorps and funding for AmeriCorps now versus 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they don't have the partisan um, uh, tone that they did. There are some who think we can afford it, some who think we can't afford it, but it's not us versus them the way it was when it was created in the mid-1990s. And I don't think it's an accident. I think it's because there are people in this room who are Democrats, there are people in this room who are Republicans. There are people who come out of AmeriCorps who are neighbors, friends, family of both Democrats and Republicans. It's become something that really is part of the fabric of what ties our communities together and ties each of us together. But it's only because all of you serve. It's only because all of you continue to care. Um, you know, this is going to be a great day here at the White House. Uh, you're going to be meeting with you know, folks here who know an awful lot about what's going on, both in terms of national service and in terms of the broader agenda. Um, I just wanted to be able to kick off the day here uh, by welcoming you, uh, by telling you how proud I am to be able to be uh, here in a room with all of you and to ask you to keep on doing what you're doing uh, because it's what, uh, what not just we here in the White House need, it's what we as Americans need. Thank you. Wow, we are so grateful to President Obama for selecting Jack Lew to, to be the Chief of Staff and such a great advocate uh, for national service and AmeriCorps, we could not could not be happier about his leadership and, and how uh, it's a priority at the White House uh, with so many wonderful supporters. So, re real treat, really, really happy to, to have him. And you're going to see John Carson, I believe, later on today, too, which, which is great. So, I wanted to let you know how important um, AmeriCorps is to me and my leadership at the role here at the Corporation for National Community Service. It's so important that I made sure that the, uh, the appointment of the National AmeriCorps Director was a former AmeriCorps VISTA, and that is Bill Basil. So Bill, welcome, and congratulations on your new site. You're, you're going to hear um, 
from Bill, Bill later today, and for those, uh, there, there are some folks here from Washington who know of Bill's legacy. I do call him the Dean of AmeriCorps. Um, he says that, when do you do that? Because I'm older than everybody else in the room. I said, no, that's not it. You really are the Dean of AmeriCorps. He has served in uh, the National Service Base for uh, several decades and brings to us a wealth of information, experiences, and some really, really good ideas, and you're going to be exposed to that uh, later in the day. So thank you, Bill, for agreeing to say yes and agreeing to serve. Really appreciate that. It was also very important to me uh, that uh, I am surrounded by some great new leadership as I have an opportunity to bring new talent to the Corporation of National Community Service. And again, I wanted to uh, make sure I was surrounded by those who are having National Service experience. So I dug, uh, didn't have to look too far, but dug deep and found a wonderful AmeriCorps alum, Jed Herman, as my senior advisor. So Jed, say hello, everybody. Jed, um, Jed is the senior advisor to the CEO, and I could not be happier that, Jed, you said yes uh, to my uh, request to come and, and help be my colleague uh, in helping move this wonderful movement ahead. And it is so great, a City Year alum, uh, I'll, I won't say how many years ago, it's been a few, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, he is already working in just a couple of weeks on the ground now and is providing great counsel to me and support uh, for our movement together. So I'm really, really grateful for that. I wanted to, just a quick shout out um, to those who put the organization, to, this together today, Victoria McCullough, John Kelly, and Patricia Borey. Where's John and Patricia? They're probably still working behind the scenes somewhere. They are somewhere, right? But anyway, we'll thank them throughout the day. It's great. And Ben Duda, oh my, what a fabulous leader we have for our AmeriCorps alums program, right? <laughs> he is unstoppable. We are so fortunate to have uh, Ben uh, working and uh, serving and leading leading the movement. I just, I, I, he's got so much energy, so many great ideas. He's so passionate. And we are forever grateful for him also agreeing to serve. There you are, Ben. I was looking like, where are you? Ben, thank you so much. We ca I, I, can't, uh, I can't express my gratitude enough about your passion, your leadership. You are the right person for the job here. It's not even a job, right? It's service and action. It's so great. I can't even think about it as a job. But uh, we really are so grateful for you. And thanks for stepping up in this great leadership role. So I am, um, and unless somebody tells me differently, I'm going to share a couple of st facts and I'm going to do some interaction now. What I would look for is a floating microphone if there's one in a minute, um, but I don't know if there's one around that we can let go of. I know because we're going to have some, I can, I can be attached to the podium, but I'd rather not. If there's one, I might be able to use that one if, does anybody know techn technology here that we could <laughs> plug that into here? Because I've done that before. You'll find out. All right, while he's finding out that, so I can get behind, from behind this podium, is let me share a few other statistics with you. I've already shared to you the billion hours, which you need to tweet about because that's just amazing. Uh, the, the 775,000 AmeriCorps members have earned, if I, if I asked you to guess this number, you'd be way off, so I'm not even going to try it. In the Siegel Education Award, $2.2 billion in college scholarships from the Siegel Education Award. That is huge. Think about the good work that is done with uh, college, is the support for continuing on to college, paying back college student loans. That has been such a great, uh, a great award. But the name Siegel Education Award should mean something to everyone. Think about Eli Siegel around helping create AmeriCorps and the Corporation for National Community Service. I was very thrilled this year to be uh, fortunately sent, confirmed by the Senate unanimously. That would have been awkward if it wasn't unanimous, right? Um, <laughs> real awkward. So I'm really thrilled about that. Uh, and forever grateful, thank you, Senate, for, uh, for confirming me. But the same day, Eli Siegel's widow was confirmed, Phyllis Siegel, uh, as a board member for the Corporation for National Community Service. And a big shout out to Phyllis. Uh, she is fabulous leader, uh, carrying out Eli's legacy of service above self and just amazing contributor on our board already. And she's just been on in a couple of months uh, serving alongside me and Matt and, and the others. So I just had to throw, remind you, if you didn't know about that, Phyllis Siegel is serving on, on our board, which is appointed again by the President and confirmed by the Senate. A couple of other interesting facts. 80% of, of AmeriCorps members exposed them 
uh, to new career, expose you to new career options uh, through your service. Over two thirds of alums, when surveyed, said their service, your service, was an advantage in the job market. Obviously, with that statistic of 80%, uh, it would be. 60% of AmeriCorps alum entering public service, which is so important because sometimes it is hard to recruit people to serve in public service, thinking about uh, private sector others, which is fabulous at, uh, in America, but we really do need um, great leaders in public service, Ser going on to serve in our military, serving as teachers, serving in uh, local governments. Um, this is such a great calling. So I'm so glad that we're having, you know, as a movement, an influence on those who are going and pursuing public service as a career. And then a majority uh, of uh, AmeriCorps members um, who didn't have a history of volunteering are doing so now which is great. So we're finding out that introducing service in a formal ma ma method through national service is having an impact on all of us as we move into uh, the second life, so serving uh, in the communities as all of you are doing. And then what I just love is the, from the survey that those who have served in national service are more in tune and more involved and engaged in the communities after the year or two years of service that occurred on the ground. So that is a goal that we all had set when Jack Lew was writing, helping write and create the Authorization for America. That was in their vision, um, that it would also create this wonderful uh, core of Americans who would serve for the rest of their life and pass that on to your family, friends, and even children. So how are we doing on technology? We've got, we have it. Victoria came through with it. So this is great, thank you. But is it working yet? Is it working? Good. So we are live streaming this today, so which is a great opportunity to be heard and talk about the impact of AmeriCorps alums. So I'm going to start. I want to do some interaction. First of all, I want to find out how many of you first trip to the White House. Show of hands. Wow, this is great. I mean, you're hitting it big. So you walk in the door of the White House, and the first person you meet is Jack Lew, the chief of staff. I mean, I don't know, we just, how can we even top that? That's fabulous. So congratulations on your first trip to the White House. Looks like the majority are here. So welcome, welcome to the White House. Um, how many of your first trip to Washington, D.C.? A few of you. Isn't it exciting? It's fabulous, isn't it? I see the Capitol and the Washington Monument every single day, and it, I've only been here four months, and it is still just a staggering moment for me. Uh, think about our history and and the leadership here that is gathered together on an uh, everyday basis. So it's a great reminder of, uh, of, of America and, and our future as well. So let's talk, I want to talk a little bit about, um, about our moments and impact that you have had in service. So this is, since I know you're all natural leaders, you're going to really help me by talking and standing up and sharing with me. This is not going to be a quiet or a shy group. So I want to hear from you. We have microphones that we, it, we can not somewhat go to you, but you might be able to come too, or talk very loudly. The only disadvantage of speaking loudly is we won't be able to be heard streaming live um, online for those that, that couldn't be with us today but, or, or with us uh, in spirit around the country. So if you can walk to those, uh, we'll, that'd be great. I don't know if we have another one of these that can roam, but if we do. Tell me about, um, think about your service when you were an AmeriCorps member. And think about one of your most proud moments, something, an epiphany, or something that you really, when you got involved in your service, that you thought to yourself, wow, uh, I am really proud to be here because. Something share with me, something service. I know, I know you're not going to be a shy group. Some, some impact that you had. Something that, yes, tell me your name and where you're from. Uh, Jared Solomon, I uh, live right here in D.C. I did Teach for America in Baltimore. Um, the proudest moment that I had, I think, when uh, when I started restarted the school that I taught at had a, a great history of having a debate team that had at one point been the best in the city. Oh. I'm usually pretty loud. Um, and a great history of having this debate team that used to be one of the best in Baltimore, um, but unfortunately, um, about 10 years before I'd gotten there, it completely disappeared, and the school had fallen on really hard times. So. Uh, teacher and I restarted the team, and we had a very small group, but um, 
one of the first major debate tournaments we went to, we only actually had three students who went to the tournament, and we were competing against schools who had like 30 or 40 kids, and we came in overall with just three kids, seventh in the entire tournament, and one of our students took home first place, and the look on her face when she got her medal, and it was her first like real big competition, um, was just amazing to me, and that's one of my best memories as a teacher. Oh, Jared, thank you so much. Did you, um, wow, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Did you stay, where are you now? Um, I actually work at, an, I came down and worked in uh, the central office in D.C. public schools for two years, and I'm a national kids advocate at an organization called First Focus, right Excellent. up the road. Great. Continuing to serve others. Appreciate that. Others, proud moment, impactful moment. Right down here, the city of your jacket I saw. three terms with AmeriCorps, two as North Carolina Campus Compact, VISTA, and one... No, might, yeah. Sorry. My name is Catherine. I did three AmeriCorps terms, so I'm definitely a very proud alum. I did two with um, North Carolina Campus Compact, and I was able to serve at Elon University as well as City Year Miami, and I'm now a staff member at City Year. Um, but one of my really favorite moments um, during my first few years of service in North Carolina was really being able to work with some of the student leaders on campus who were helping engage students across the campus um, to get together in service. And one of the things we did was we launched the first ever MLK Day of Service at Elon University. So we brought together a lot of different student affairs offices on campus as well as it was really the first service event that that campus had done in partnership with students, faculty, as well as community members because typically their service was out in the community at nonprofits but actually volunteering side by side with members of the local community I think was a great connection point to everybody and really helped them see their local community. So that was a really exciting time. Outstanding. Thank you so much. And uh, City of Miami, love City of Miami, and I, and I was in head of the Governor's Commission on Volunteerism in Florida when we were able to see City of Miami start up, and it's doing so great. You're here, so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Big shout out to all my friends there. Others, yes. Um, how you doing, Ms. Spencer? This is Jamal Alexander from Pennsylvania. Um, I guess mine was doing my second term. Um, I didn't want to get in trouble, you know, living in a community that I was in, you know, hood, urban, however you want to call it. And um, I used to just kind of play basketball, interact with the kids, and I started realizing I didn't want to go home, and the kids didn't want to go home. But then at the same time, they would come from school and be up into the community center until about 8, 9 o'clock. Long story short, um, I said, you know what, in order for us to kind of interact with each other and play in a gym, why don't we just start doing our homework? Because they would just be in there and like, okay, when do you do your homework? You see what I'm saying? So long story short, um, started off with two girls, a sister team, and then they used to, basically sheep begat sheep. They started bringing their friends, and we started the homework help program, and now we collaborate with everybody. So it's a blessing to kind of have that organization still going on with the homework help. So. Oh, that is fantastic. <laughs> Jamal. Thanks, Jamal. You know, um, I love hearing that because one of our obstacles in education today is making studying and learning and education cool. I mean, the, you know, really, it's, it's actually a little bit of a challenge in some communities. Um, there are students who are badgered for wanting to study and wanting to learn. And, wanting to, and one great thing about AmeriCorps, especially young members like you at the time, can get in and teach them this is really cool and it's fun. And, it is going to get you ahead. And sometimes they need that near peer mentorship to, in order to you know, kind of gain that confidence and want to move ahead. So that homework help program, it, that's a great step in the right direction for that. So thank you so much. Others, one in the back here, one over here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to DC. Um, my name is Philip Plus, and um, I served my term in Manchester, New Hampshire with the city of Manchester. VISTA project, and um, I was placed at an organization called Families in Transition, which is a nonprofit homeless services organization. And I guess my proudest moment when I was there, um, we have an event called Project Homeless Connect, which is kind of like a one-stop shop for homeless people to come in and get connected to services such as housing and that type of thing, medical care. And I guess one of my proudest moments was when there was a young man who came in who was obviously having a kind of a mental episode um, and getting him able to get him connected to care with his case manager and being able to track him down was really just kind of a, 
a moment that has still stayed with me and um, kind of really sort of served as the reason why I chose to continue my service with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I work um, in the Office of Community Planning and Development there, um, and our office runs a housing program for low-income people living with HIV and AIDS. And so this issue of homelessness has always been very dear to my heart. So um, that was definitely my one of my sort of moments that have kept me on the path of being in public service. So. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you so much. That's great. You know, one of the, you pointed out a great, is, is it Phil, Philip? Yeah. Philip, you've pointed out a great advantage. One great advantage of AmeriCorps, and I hear this from volunteer managers who have AmeriCorps programs in their communities, in their organizations, is they said the training is so important. Um, and we are, you know, when we, a part of AmeriCorps is the training that we put in place, and one of the things that I hear back from feedback is those indicators, being trained to look for issues and problems of the population they're serving. While you might not have the particular experience uh, to address that personally, but you are trained to look for those types of problems and report it to the appropriate uh, you know, authority that is, you're working with in the environment, whether it's a school or a healthcare facility or whatever it is. But, that, um, that is a great need because it's extra eyes and ears. It's people that are paying attention and can link people up to services. Um, sometimes even when it's not your direct service, it's not about that. So thanks for pointing that out. I uh, saw another one here. Right here. Great. Sorry, it looks like I got the mic. I'll pass it on. <laughs> so I'm Bethany Hamilton. Um, thank you, Ms. Spencer, once again. Please call me Wendy. Wendy. <laughs> um, so I do a lot now. Um, I'm actually with the National Association of Community Health Centers with our community health core team. Um, but prior to doing a lot, I served as an Equal Justice Works AmeriCorps legal fellow. It's one of the few lawyer programs. Um, and I didn't think I was doing much. The moment I realized I was doing a little bit more than not much was when in my reentry law program that I started at Legal Assistance of Western New York, I um, had a client who was faced with a uh, social services overpayment, supposedly. He had just been released from prison. And as you can imagine, with no job, just being released from prison, hard to get a job. You have the criminal record that you're facing. You have a $700 payment. You might do something that'll push you right back into the system. Um, so I decided I'm gonna fight his case, despite everything, all the adversities. We fought, we won, we got rid of the overpayment and uh, to my knowledge, he's still, be, he's still now a productive member of the community. So um, I mention him because we, we look at people with criminal records sometimes and we say, ah, oh, that's horrible. Still human beings. And I'm so proud to say I managed to keep somebody out of the system and uh, contributing to our community. That was my experience. Awesome. Awesome, Bethany. Thank you so much, Bethany. Wow. Yes, we have a microphone back here maybe, or is it over here? There's only one. Hi, uh, my name is Megan Bellato. I served at AmeriCorps years ago, actually at the Points of Light Hands-On Network, back when it was just Hands-On Network. And um, I had a really unique AmeriCorps experience in that I was in an office and we were doing a lot of, I was working in Atlanta with uh, an AmeriCorps member based in Boston and one based in Seattle. And so we were given this opportunity, Dolores Morton, who is one of the Champions for Change here, um, was my supervisor. And she let us sort of create this program because we really wanted to engage college students in service. So I worked nationally with these other two programs across the country, and we traveled all over the place and worked with college students to get them engaged. So our proudest moment, and I remember it very clearly, we worked for probably about two months to get uh, students together in Boston. And we engaged eight schools and 900 students for a full day of service all around the city of Boston. And I remember we were traveling all around and going to all these different sites and looking at all these students who were working together from different schools and engaged in all these different types of projects that we had set up. And we just felt like we had really communicated the value of community service um, to these students and got them in a way that that is the purpose of this, and we were really, really excited, and that was, I think about that a lot. And thank you, Dolores, you were wonderful. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> that is great. You know, another benefit, I, I have to keep pick, uh, pointing out these benefits. Another benefit of AmeriCorps is, is showing a service, giving the opportunity for service for others. No one in the room uh, 
because we all have this service above self type of DNA, uh, it, become, it comes naturally to us. But there are millions of Americans who don't think about service every day like we do. So when we expose them to service, it clicks. Something happens. It says, you know, I can, I have something to contribute back to the community, and I can make a difference. And you would think that would be, you know, come easily with everyone, but it doesn't. And some people just need the pathway to how do you get engaged. They just want to be led to what, you know, how do I even start? So that is just a wonderful benefit. Saw other hands here. Great. I've seen you. We've got to get this from down here in the front, too, in a minute. Hi. Yes. Good morning, Wendy, and good morning, alums. My name is Allie Snell and I currently work for the Peace Corps. I'm a proud AmeriCorps VISTA alum, and also a proud returned Peace Corps volunteer who served in Guatemala. Awesome. And my career in service started, like many of you, after college when I became a VISTA volunteer working in western New Mexico on the Navajo Reservation with a group of nine other VISTAs. I had a lot of amazing experiences, and um, it was both one of the most formative and exciting uh, times of my life. One of the projects I'm most proud of was actually I worked alongside a Teach for America uh, Corps member who was working at a boarding school for Native American students out on the reservation. And we developed a um, basically a professional development opportunity for these students to work alongside different federal employees who worked in the sciences. So hydrologists, geologists, archaeologists, and, and developed a shadowing and mentoring program. Through this program, the students actually restored a 30-acre section of a now defunct U.S. Army base that once had seen many different species of wild animals and native plants had been you know, eradicated in its use as a base and now is a flourishing park area where the students are not only managing this project but getting valuable experience and having a trail network to work on as well. So very, very proud of the lessons that uh, VISTA taught me and proud to be a member of the service community. Oh, that Thank is you. a fabulous story. Thank you so much. <laughs> fabulous. Right down here. Wonderful. Hello, um, my name is Tiffany Zapico, and I served in AmeriCorps NCCC in class 13 and 14. Um, and just thinking about NCCC, you know, it's really hard to pick one moment or one time because during your 10 months of service, you just do so much and you have so many different projects and go all over the country. So I'm trying to think of one, but um, it was a year after Hurricane Katrina when I did my service, and at that time, we have over 4,000 AmeriCorps and C members that served in the Gulf region, that served almost 3 million hours just on disaster recovery in the Gulf, um, doing so many different things. Me personally, I, I know that we served meals to people who needed food, who didn't have food or water. We gutted homes, we built homes, and we really served so many different members in the community. People would come up to us all the time and just say, thank you, thank you so much for being here. Um, and the conditions people were living in at that time were just unbearable. So that whole time, I have to just shout out everybody who you know, gave to the Gulf region after Hurricane Katrina because it was such a huge need, and I'm so proud to have served during that time with my team. Yes. At, at, amen, that was great, great work. Katrina alum story is just a fabulous legacy about service and reaction to uh, some of our times in greatest need. I know there's one here, one here. Back, Grace, there they go. Do you want me to go? I don't care. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Rachel Turner. I did uh, a year of AmeriCorps VISTA with Global Citizen, which is the organization that coordinates the Greater Philadelphia Martin Luther King Day of Service. And the project that I was the most proud of to work on was our service club's curriculum uh, that taught students about the life and legacy of Dr. King and then from there how they could be agents of positive change in their communities by coordinating volunteer projects. So when I started working on the curriculum, it was this 25-page document for students in grades K to 6. After I finished it, uh, we had two curricula, one for students in K to 5, one for 6 to 8, and I established a partnership with Philadelphia Education Works that year. They launched the program in 18 Philadelphia public schools, a little over 900 children participated. I was lucky enough to stay with Global Citizen, that's where I'm working now, awesome. and uh, Education Works is still using that curriculum in different Philadelphia public schools, so awesome. that was probably my favorite moment. Uh, oh, that's project. great. Thank you. Um, hi folks, I'm Jason Scott. Um, I served in 2006 with AmeriCorps and Triple C in 2007 with uh, Florida State Parks, Perry Point campus. Um, AmeriCorps and Triple C, I would have, I, I'd call my transformative year 
and AmeriCorps. Um, similar experience, a lot of disaster recovery. Um, those opportunities were tremendous, but I actually got my, my aha moment at the end of the year when I was offered an opportunity to, to assume a leadership role as a team leader, because I was a core member throughout the year, and I had a fantastic year. Um, at the end of the year, they were looking to fill a spot for a team that had had a, a rockier year, that would never happen. Ne uh, never. <laughs> um, and at that moment, I was uh, presented with the choice between whether to go on a wildfire or to assume that leadership role, knowing that as a team leader of a non-fire team, I would not go on a wildfire. And big, big hullabaloo about going on a fire that year. So it was a, it was a tough choice. Uh, um, but I made it, and I was so thankful because from that experience, I learned that the only thing more important to me than serving is helping other people find their passion and service. It's immensely transformative. Um, I now work for the town of Farragut, Tennessee, in Knoxville. <laughs> um, and we now have our own AmeriCorps program where we have service members, so it's come full circle, and now every year I get to contribute in that way. Oh, that's fabulous. You. So you're helping manage an AmeriCorps team? Um, we just have one person. You have one. Um, Not just one. <laughs> one is fabulous. <laughs> but it's fantastic. That's great. That's Thank great. You. Thank you so much. I love that. Other thoughts? Some back here in the front? We're, yeah, we can come down here. It would be great. Uh, and the next question I was going to ask you is about seeing it as a career pathway to your career. And I'm hearing this sort of underpinning everywhere. Well, that's a great segue, actually. Um, my name is Allison Dubois, and I was a, a member in the Community Health Corps program, which is a national direct program working out of federally qualified health centers. So I did two years of service in that program and worked on a, a number of innovative programming, Reach Out and Read, which um, encourages children to read by having the physicians prescribe reading as a part of their visit. And so it's a way to bridge the issues of, of health care and education. Um, and now I've, I've been with community health centers uh, since that year of service in 97, and I'm currently the chief operating officer of that network of health centers. Wow. So in terms of career development, it's been instrumental in defining and helping me explore what the opportunities were uh, within healthcare and within uh, an organization that was so responsive to national service and to developing young people and volunteers. Wow, that is fabulous. <laughs> fabulous. We got, we, we, they're everywhere. We want to get to everybody. <laughs> this, is so, this is great. Hello, Wendy. Hello, everybody. My name is Erasmus Mungari. I served with Public Allies in Delaware. And, ooh, Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, during my time, what, uh, what one thing that I truly remember uh, while I was serving with an organization called Volunteers for Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention was uh, going into schools, community centers, and teaching kids about healthy lifestyles. I remember one particular evening, I'd gone into an organization called Girls Inc. and made a presentation about uh, sexually transmitted diseases. And uh, after I finished, one girl said, may I share something? And she shared that at age 12, she had contracted a sexually transmitted disease, and she didn't tell her mother. And by the time her mother discovered, and they went to the doctor, the doctor told her probably she could never have a kid. And at that moment, there was silence in the room, about 30, 30, 30 young girls. And you could see their eyes opening, and then the silence turned into questions. That moment, uh, to me, was a revealing one, because later on, as uh, we progressed through our year of service, uh, there was a team service project through Public Allies. We ended up creating a, a healthy lifestyle curriculum, which was used in schools to teach kids about uh, healthy lifestyle, sexu sexually transmitted diseases, uh, good decision making, etc. And since then, I, after my year of service, I ended up finishing, went into drug and alcohol counseling in the prison, left there, went to teach, and currently serving as a the executive director for the Governor's Commission in Delaware. And very proud of the work that uh, America for me did for me because it brought me, uh, especially coming from Kenya, where, was, where I'm originally from, came without the knowledge of volunteerism, came learned about volunteerism in this country, and it has ignited a fire in me, which I'm not only using 
here in the US and in Delaware in particular, but also in my home country because volunteerism is a new concept there. So definitely proud of what America oh, did for me. Such a, <laughs> such a wonderful, wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that. In the back row and then here, thank you. The back row? Yes, right, uh, she's been raising her hand from the beginning. Hi, I'm Megan Hyde. Um, I served with Notre Dame Mission Volunteers in Watsonville, California, which is a teeny tiny town. Um, it's basically made up of migrant farm workers and education was never a focus. So I worked in a charter school that, uh, the point of the charter school was to get the middle school students in a college focused mindset. And I did a bunch of stuff. I was like a classroom aide, I ran detention. I started a reading club and I, it, the reading club was my favorite part. I was able to get all the students to have books to take home, and I love to read, and I love getting other people to read. Um, the reading club was where I met my favorite student, Luis. Uh, he struggled in school, like with education, it, like he didn't understand his classes, and he struggled like with his behavior sometimes. But he loved to read, so he'd come to me and he'd ask me for book suggestions, and we'd talk about books, and then that led us to talking about other things. So when he'd have trouble in school, he'd come to me and we'd talk the problems through. And we got close and I tutored him and I helped him throughout the year. At the end of the year though, he found out he was gonna, he didn't pass enough classes and he was gonna be held back. So he decided to drop out in the eighth grade. I was devastated. So I sent him a message online and I was like, I don't know what you're going through at all. But I know that life without passing the eighth grade is going to be infinitely difficult. So I said, if you ever want to talk to somebody who's not going to judge you and you can trust, talk to me. So he sent me a message and he told me that he got jumped just about every day walking home from school. His family life was really bad. He was from a single family household and it was just really bad. And he just didn't understand any of his classes. We continued to talk. Uh, for like two or three weeks over the internet. And he finally made the decision to go back to school. Uh, he joined a program so that he could make up the credits for the eighth grade that he missed and still graduate high school on time. He told me that I was part of the reason why he went back to school. And I'm friends with him on Facebook now. <laughs> and so we stay in contact and that's just something that's gonna stay with me forever. And now I work for the organization that I volunteered with. I'm a site director and I have 17 members in two different states oh. that are working in schools and having similar experiences to what I had. Wow. So. That is an amazing, amazing story. That's incredible. Incredible. Wow. Thank you. I, I was so enthralled in the story. I, I didn't hear your name. Oh, Megan. Megan. Thank you, Megan. Wow. That's, that's something pretty special. It really is. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adam Horton. I'm uh, from Seattle, Washington currently. Um, I served in the United States Armed Forces for eight years uh, after I got out. Any other veterans in the room? Raise your hands. Thank you. Thank you. After I got out, I started college at Seattle Central and uh, I was invited to join uh, Vet Corps. And a new America Corps project that's hopefully going to be going na nationwide soon. Um, and I'm currently the director of Seattle Stand Down uh, for homeless and at-risk veterans. Uh, one of the moments I think would have to come from uh, when Occupy Seattle uh, was on our campus. Uh, I was holding an event for vendors to come and provide information for student veterans. And we had some of the Occupy members who were veterans themselves come into the school and took advantage of, of uh, some of the opportunities that were there. Uh, one veteran in particular uh, had gotten out of the service. Uh, he was an Army Ranger and he was a, a scout sniper. Um, when he got out of the service, he moved to Mexico. Didn't talk to his family for two years. He left the country. When he came back, he was a missing person uh, when he came back. He just couldn't deal with it. And that's, that's a systemic problem with a lot of veterans now. Um, he got into counseling because of that event. And that's just one person uh, in a plethora of stories that I, that I have and that uh, are continuing to have for veterans in Washington State. Um, and I truly hope this program goes nationwide because it's a need. Wow. Thank you. That is great. You know, as, um, as you're finding the next person, 
Um, we have, I have a senior advisor for specifically focused on veterans and military families. He's here today, Cubby Langley. Cubby, uh, former JAG, Army JAG. Uh, so happy to have uh, a veteran serving as my senior advisor for Veterans Military Affairs. Uh, there are over, Cubby, I think a thousand veterans serving as American members today. Uh, is that right? Um, any other statistics you want to share with the group? First time this year, um, we hit the thousand mark for this for this fiscal year for today. Kobe, speak of this because we're streaming live. I want everyone to hear this. <laughs> sure. So for the first time in the history of the corporation, there are 1,000 AmeriCorps members on the streets serving veterans and military families. So hula. Hula. <laughs> Ma'am, in addition to that, as you know, uh, there's been over uh, 26,000 AmeriCorps alumni who have been veterans and have served as, as AmeriCorps members since the inception of the corporation. So, hula. <laughs> and I got your charge. We're going to do more, we're going to do better, and we're going to continue to serve veterans and military families. So, thank you, ma'am. Uh, it's great. It's really, it's one of our top priorities is to engage veterans in service and serve veterans and the military families as well and their needs um, as they return back uh, from the war and as they come, uh, and, they, and they come back to America and they do have needs and we need to reach out to them. We need to give back to them as they have been giving to us and making that sacrifice that is oh so tremendous to give us our freedoms and that's the least that we can do is be there for them for every need and any need they have. And that is a real priority at the corporation, and I'm really thrilled to have uh, a veteran serving and leading us in that space. And we've just announced a great program with VISTA, 100 VISTAs with National Guard. We're uh, asking National Guard organizations all over the, the country to work with us and place an AmeriCorps VISTA in their National Guard program to help in their state uh, focus on uh, returning veterans and military family members, um, whatever their needs are, there's absolutely, you know, no need too small or too big that we can't try to help them with. So, so glad to have Kobe leading the way on that. Others, next, yes. Good morning. Hey, Wendy. Good morning. Um, like my friend Bethany, uh, my name is Marty Costello, and I was a, a public interest lawyer helping people in AmeriCorps. Some important people in the White House are also public interest lawyers, so um, just wanted to point that out, too. Um, and when I, I served in Philadelphia, an organization called Philadelphia VIP, um, and the program back then was called the Pro Bono Legal Corps. And one client happened to have some problems with her, the title to her home, and I helped people uh, with foreclosure and those types of problems. And because she didn't have title to her home, she uh, couldn't pay the delinquent utility bills, so the city was going to foreclose upon her property, and she had a grandchild and some small children living with her. Uh, long story short, after about a year, uh, I, a lot of negotiating, a lot of paperwork, I called her up and told her that she finally owned her own home and she didn't need to worry about foreclosure anymore. And she just started to cry. She didn't have to worry about that anymore. And I really liked doing that. I liked helping people stay in their homes. And now I'm the director of National Service Programs at Rebuilding Together. We believe keeping uh, everyone in a safe and healthy home, so I've been able to continue that. Uh, and part of that is because of my client. So, oh, thank you so much. That's uh, on that note. Uh, that's a good note to uh, to end this session on. And I hope we'll have other opportunities throughout the day to share these stories. But I want you to think about what you've just been doing. You have sharing been sharing how you have changed lives, communities, how it's impacted people for the rest of their life, uh, pr making sure they graduate making sure they have a home, making sure they have a healthy lifestyle and good choices, uh, making sure they're ca cared for after a disaster. These stories are amazing. So I have a request of you. I want you to go back to your communities after today and feel supercharged to be our champions of service in your communities and tell these stories to everyone who will listen. Find opportunities to share these stories. Uh, go back into AmeriCorps alum programs, get together. Here's one idea I want to share with you. Think about how impactful this would be. If, if, if you would go back and gather up several alums in your community, in your hometowns, no matter how small or big, whether it's Philadelphia or Evansville or some small community, get together, call up the local newspaper, 
ask to speak to the editorial board and say, we want to, we've got a story we think is very interesting for you. And we want to bring together some AmeriCorps alums who are living in this community, who are doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers, medical professionals, uh, mechanics, uh, social service workers, working in nonprofits. We're, there, there's many of us in our community, and we want to tell our story of how we are impacting the community today in our careers and how we got here and the impact that AmeriCorps had in our pathway to the role that we're having and playing in the community today. That would be an amazing story from editorial board to hear. And I've worked with editorial boards and they are looking for great stories and you have got an amazing story. We have got, in order to thrive and continue and to marshal ahead and continue the movement of national service, we have to get our stories told. We've got to get it out to national leaders, to mayors, to governors, to anyone who will listen, uh, state and federal elected officials who will hear and see the, image, the, the impact that you're having. Anyone that was sitting in this room or anyone that's living, uh, hearing us live around the country, there's no one that can listen to this and say, I need to find a way to get behind national service even more than I have before. You are making a difference that no other program can do like AmeriCorps can do and VISTA and senior corps programs. Our national service programs are just a real gem and we've got to have more of you serving in more locations. We're through the whole, all of the programs of the Corporation of National Service are serving in 70,000 locations across America. I tell everyone I can just about anywhere, go anywhere in America and step outside and yell, AmeriCorps, are you there? And someone will yell back. <laughs> That's how prominent it is all over the country. So will you do that for me? Will you tell, will you go back and agree to tell these stories in some kind of public forum? Will you do that? Yes. Great. Yes. I want to hear that. So in exchange, what I will do for you is I will be a passionate leader for you for the alums to support Ben and the entire AmeriCorps alum program. I will be a passionate leader for the Corporation of National Service. I will work hard to make sure we have great programs, they're impactful, and also be able to tell the story on a national level. And I'll do that in exchange for you. The only other request I have for you is join AmeriCorps alums, those that are not already members, but I think everybody here is. Get five more friends next week to join who are alums. And let's make this movement huge. Let's help Ben make sure that he has a huge movement of AmeriCorps alums across the country that will join you in telling the story so that we can grow AmeriCorps and national service and then grow the impact and let everyone feel the spirit that is so, so prevalent in the room today. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. I am supercharged after hearing these stories and I'm really excited to be leading the Corporation for National Community Service along with you. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ben Duda. Thank you, Ben. This is amazing. So I apologize for being late, but we couldn't get a one-year-old past the Secret Service. So, um, so it took a little while. Our champions came in. Real quick, I have the honor to introduce our next presenter. But if anyone's sitting next to an empty seat, can we do this like church? Raise your hand. Can we get people who are standing or people who need seats? If you know that there's seats out there so we can see that. So. Um, without any further ado, I have the, the privilege um, to really invite the, the individual who's behind opening up the White House for communities, opening up the White House today for the Champions of Change program in AmeriCorps alumni community. Uh, so I'd like to welcome from the White House Office of Public Engagement, John Carson. Thank you, ben. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. How's your day at the White House been so far? Excellent. Well, thank you all of you who are here. Thank you to our champions. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Wendy Spencer um, for being here and all that you do. And thanks to everyone following along online. And let me start by thanking you not just for what you're doing here today, but what you did as AmeriCorps alumni. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer uh, in Honduras in, in 2004 to six. So. I understand something that I think uh, those of us who've been part of, of service, um, it, it's not, it, <clears throat> unless you've been there, you don't understand the saying that we feel like we've learned so much more than we've been able to give. 
Um, and I will tell you that in the position I have now, there is not a day that goes by that I don't draw upon those lessons I learned, those people I got to work with, um, and the experiences that I have. It's not just an experience we had, it, it's who we are. Um, we carry that, that service with us. So thank you um, for everything you did and, and for inspiring others. And um, I'm here today, as this part of the program, to make another ask of all of you. Uh, and that's to tell your story. Tell the story of your experience here today, what you liked, what you didn't like. Tell your story of service and tell your story of what you saw on the ground uh, in communities across the country. There's a debate going on uh, in this country right now about what is the role of federal government. Um, I'm sure you're fairly aware uh, there are those who think that AmeriCorps shouldn't be a part of, of what the federal government does. And what we've learned, what my office does, what the Office of Public Engagement does, is connect people, connect organizations, connect people to the federal government, the programs we have, connect them to the president's agenda. We fill South Court Auditorium like this. We're live streamed uh, many different times a week. But it is rare that we have an audience, uh, and, and I presume a, a group following us along online, who understands at their core what makes this country work and what makes communities move forward. And that's the story that I ask you to tell, because these debates that we're having um, over what is the role of the federal government and what kind of programs do we want to prioritize, you don't win those arguments at the macroeconomic level. You don't win those by explaining where treasury bonds are and why it's a good time to invest. You win it by explaining how this works. And one lesson uh, that I'm sure many of you saw on the ground is that often that role of the federal government is actually hidden in that story. When people know the great work that happened with Habitat for Humanity, with the Red Cross, with a Teach for America, it isn't always obvious and clear to them that one of the partners in that story moving communities forward was the federal government. And that's a really important story to tell, to tell that this was a partnership, that this was an investment by individuals giving of their time, making very little money by the taxpayers of this country, and how those partnerships can uh, be what moves community forward. And, and I ask you to tell that story partly for that debate uh, that is going on right now. Um, and I think uh, as AmeriCorps alumni, you have seen that when we tell those stories, we can win those budget discussions. But I also um, ask you to tell the, your stories, your stories from how this worked on the ground to inspire others to action, to inspire others to see that we can move our country forward. What we see right now um, <clears throat> from our Office of Public Engagement, talking to people around the country, is that people need right now concrete examples. They don't want to hear, again, macroeconomic theories about change and social entrepreneurship. They think that's great, but they want to know concrete stories about how this worked from Philadelphia to Los Angeles uh, to the rural parts of South Dakota. And that's what each and every one of you can provide. So tweet about it if you're on Twitter. We're using hashtag WHAmericorps uh, today. Um, blog about it. Write about it. Stop three people in the bowling alley this weekend and tell them that you're an AmeriCorps alum. Tell them you were at the White House because this president believes in national service and get them engaged in the conversation as well. So with that, I, I'd like to take a few questions, but also hear your stories. Tell us how you're making these connections on uh, communities across the country. So who wants to jump in and go first? All right, yes. Hi, I'm Natalie uh, Brown. I also actually work with Notre Dame Mission Volunteers with Megan Hyde, who told that story um, about Watsonville. Uh, at Notre Dame Mission Volunteers, uh, we're a national direct AmeriCorps program. We, uh, much like AmeriCorps partners with us, we partner with sites across um, different communities in the US. Currently, we're in 23. Um, and we seek out different organizations and schools that have missions similar to ours, which is to empower um, those through education. So we serve uh, in DC and in Baltimore. These are just two examples, but um, in Baltimore, we have a pretty big focus on uh, helping the incarcerated um, transition out afterwards. Uh, whereas in DC, um, a lot of our uh, members serve with different partnering sites like schools uh, in Southeast DC, um, Washington Middle School for Girls is one of them. Uh, and different organizations like Mary House and um, uh, Reading First to really 
kind of engage with the community, hear their story, be part of the community um, to kind of create change. So that's how we do it. Well, and I'd be curious, um, lots of different people involved in these programs, in, in the chain there, do you think they all have a sense of the full story of, of the partnership? Are they all aware of the federal connection? Are they all aware of how many times these resources are, are leveraged? I know with our AmeriCorps members, I mean, they kind of wear that badge with pride. Um, they explain that this is part, they're part of this, you know, collective community across the U.S. Um, they do talk about, I mean, we all know that this is part of the government, um, that it is a federally funded program. Um, people know about that AmeriCorps is part of the larger CNCS, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're under that umbrella. Um, and they definitely declare that to their students and they get, I mean, some of our members have gotten their students and their um, community members involved through that. Excellent. Well, thank you for your help. All right. Marissa Thomas, and I'm coming from Tallahassee, Florida, and yay, thank you. Um, and to answer that question, a year and a half ago, I did not know about AmeriCorps. I'm actually a native of Bronx, New York, and so when I moved down here from my, with my adoptive parents, I, I wish I knew about AmeriCorps, because then that would, uh, is a great opportunity where they have AmeriCorps NCCC. I didn't know about Senior Corps, and I was able to, one of my mentors who's in Jacksonville, Florida, she just got a job. I told her about it through Duval Reads. And so I think AmeriCorps, I think this summit, I think having the conference, when I was able to go to the conference in Florida, for AmeriCorps is absolutely wonderful because now the word is being spread and many young people, it's no age limit, um, young and old can support, come out and do public service in their communities and be proud about it. Excellent, well thank you. And I think the story you told is completely reflects something we see here every day just in terms of how does communication work these days. Theoretically, every single thing, C uh, CNCS, everything, every part of the federal government, everything, any one of the organizations you worked with, theoretically, you could find out all about it with one search on Google, right? Theoretically, we're surrounded by information, but I think we all feel like in our day-to-day -day lives, nobody knows what's going on. <coughs> what we see is that communication has changed in that uh, two things are happening. Because we all feel surrounded by information, we think we know everything there is to know about what's going on out there. If we haven't heard of it, it probably isn't happening. The second thing is that because there's all this information, people have added a new filter. It's not just what am I hearing, it's who's telling it to me. So those, um, um, what we see is that word of mouth and those circles of influence that uh, people that follow, from people that follow you on Facebook to that mommy blog that you are a, a part of in uh, Northwest DC like my wife and I, those networks are more important than ever. Um, you all know how this works. You have that neighbor that you would trust to tell you which car shop you should go to, but it might be a different one that you would trust uh, which pediatrician you should go to. That's how people absorb information now. So um, telling your story in those circles that you all have, um, where we have seen this to be most true is with the uh, new healthcare law. Everyone who's under 26 can get on their parents' insurance now when they graduate from college. But only, it was great, um, but here's the thing. That only happens if you find out about it and then take a step to do it. So we've looked at how do people find out about it. It turns out one mom telling another at the basketball game, did you make sure Susie got on your insurance? More people find out about it through word of mouth than every story that's been written in the New York Times and Washington Post. So keep telling these stories uh, to inspire other people to be a part of the AmeriCorps experience. Uh, who else has a question or a story? Yes. Hello again. Um, so my name is Tiffany, and in my current work, I work for a nonprofit called Reading Partners. Uh, we were based, yes, we have another colleague here. Hi, Jeremy. Um, <laughs> we were based in Oakland Bay Area for about 12 years, and 
uh, two years ago, we were a recipient of the Social Innovation Fund grant. Oh, um, it was $3.5 million that enabled our organization to go national. So we started in the Bay Area. We recruit and train volunteers who then come into Title I schools and work one-on-one -on -one with students to increase their reading levels. Uh, the Social Innovation Fund was critical in our expansion. Uh, we also receive funding for AmeriCorps VISTA, AmeriCorps State and National. So in the past two years, our organization went from just being in the Bay Area to expanding to Sacramento, LA, Denver, Baltimore, Dallas, New York, um, going from sort of having, I think we had 30, 70 AmeriCorps members last year, 150 this year, and we serve three, the, um, sorry, 3,000 students last year, we're gonna serve 5,000 this year, and we also engaged 3,000 volunteers, la I'm sorry, 3,000 volunteers last year and 5,000 volunteers this year. And that is just incredible. Um, every month the student is in our program, they grow 1.6 months in their reading skills based on our, our volunteer, volunteer engagement, also thanks to our AmeriCorps members who run our sites. So incredible impact through the Social Innovation Fund. And what's the name of your organization again? Reading Partners. So here's the other reason I, I will ask all of you to help tell your story and tell the story of the reading partners out there. Have you all noticed, as a former Peace Corps volunteer, pretty much everyone who is on their way out from Peace Corps at one point either thinks or eventually does, you know, I'm going to create my own NGO that's going to do X, Y, and Z. <laughs> it's, for some reason, I think it's just the human condition, when someone has a great idea, it's bad news when you tell them somebody's already doing that and they're doing a great job. But we need to change that. We need to lift up the reading partners out there. So when someone is excited about this, they join the effort. We need, um, we, we frankly need some consolidation, I think, uh, in the nonprofit world. And you can all help, you can help make that happen. Oh, yes. Good morning. Uh, I'm Arthur Dean, uh, a retired military person. And in my new uh, capacity, I'm chairman and CEO of an organization called Community Anti-Drug Coalition of America. And CATCA fortunately received a grant from Wendy and uh, CNCS uh, on both sides of the house, AmeriCorps and VISTA. And we are placing uh, 100 uh, former military members in VISTA and AmeriCorps positions in our community coalitions throughout America. And, uh, Excellent. And those coalitions, primary responsibility is to deal with substance abuse and its broad range of issues. But in this program, we are not only, uh, our purpose is to receive veterans and their families back in their communities and not only help them with issues that are related to substance abuse, but to help them with any and all issues, whether it's employment, whether it's family issues, children issues, et cetera. And we're so proud that we have in the room one of the leaders who is an alum of this program, Kayla Harris over here, who's helping us sure. implement this program. And we just are so excited. And we believe uh, corporate, corporate America, state leaders, community leaders are on board. And we can see this one day not being 100, but being many, many more. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you um, for what you're doing. You know, I'm, I'm very proud to work for the president who brought an end to the Iraq war. Um, but I know he also wants to be a president who makes sure that these million plus men and women who've served our country in those wars um, are, um, when they come home, um, they're integrated into our communities and we provide every possible level of support for them. And I think it is a community that is both very, very interested in service but one of those communities that doesn't necessarily know about all the support networks that are out there. We often hear, um, we had a whole Champion of Change event uh, with Iraq war vets and Afghanistan war vets who have come home and, and become part of providing veteran services back in their hometowns. But I think just an incredible opportunity to connect them to everything um, all of your organizations are doing. So thank you for your great work. All right, yes. Hi, my name's Katie Comerford. I'm a VISTA alum and the executive director for Jumpstart DC. Uh, at Jumpstart, we are asking around 3,500 college students across the country to serve close to 10,000 young children to prepare them for kindergarten to succeed in school and life. And one of the great things that I get to be a part of is not only inspiring more people to serve through college and beyond, but they actually get to uh, leverage their work study award, their federal work study mm. award to enable them to serve through college and of course give back to the communities that they're actually new to because they're college students. So 
they're really able to sort of uh, build upon multiple benefits from not only AmeriCorps, but the federal work study that they're, uh, they're able to receive. So thank you. Well, fantastic. It's, it's definitely an example of, of leveraging multiple parts of the federal government uh, to provide the maximum both to our volunteers um, and to, uh, to the communities as well. So a great example we can, uh, I'm glad we're able to help lift up. Hi. Hello, my name is Emily Gilliland. I'm from Portland, Oregon, which is 2,810 miles from here. Can anyone beat that? <laughs> anyone? What's that? Seattle. Anyone beat that? Seattle. Okay, well. Pacific Northwest. All right. <laughs> I'm the proud AmeriCorps alum of a program called Volunteer Maryland, which I know Rhonda is as well. Any other Volunteer Maryland folks here? Fantastic, it's a great program. And I currently serve on the Oregon Commission on Voluntary Action and Service. Sort of to build on your comment, I think one of the really important stories that we have to tell is the impact that national service has on college access and success. Um, I'm the executive director of Oregon Campus Compact, so we work with college students, activating them in service, and we work with college presidents. And one of the most important pieces of data that I've been able to get about national service is how many millions of dollars go into our higher education community because of the national service programs. Uh, sure. um, and in Oregon, we're 49th out of 50 with regard to college going. Um, and our students uh, leave school with about $34,000 in college debt. So as I'm able to talk to college presidents and talk to higher education, it's not only important to talk about the personal development that we all feel from um, our national service experience and the community impact that we have, but also the economic aspect of this, because these national service awards that are going into our higher education community are building the leadership. Um, in our communities near and far. So make sure to talk to the colleges and universities that you went to about how important national service was in building your own leadership um, and led you to college success for those of you who graduated from either a two-year or four-year school. Excellent. Thank you so much. A couple more people here. I feel like Oprah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Nick Vallel, a uh, Return Peace Corps volunteer from uh -huh. Togo, uh, AmeriCorps volunteer in New Orleans. Uh, Wendy had an, an interesting point earlier in that not everyone out there has the desire or um, thinks about getting into volunteer service and we have to find new and creative ways to get them, to tell the story and get them involved. Uh, so one thing that I'm doing with a partner is actually uh, trying to find a way to bring charitable giving into day-to-day -day living. Yeah. So we're actually opening a bar and restaurant here in Washington, D.C where 100% of the profits are given to charitable, charities. Yeah. So I think we have to find new ways, and I, I think I challenge everyone here to say, how can we engage the public uh, to get involved uh, in ways that are more convenient for them? Because I think once they have that chance to hear the story about what a great charitable organization is doing, then often they're going to engage and become more engaged and maybe volunteer, maybe donate, et cetera. So hopefully coming next month, CAUSE Washington, D.C. will be opening. Excellent. I, I just couldn't agree more that it's that personal connection that I, that I think makes it real for people. Otherwise, it's this thing other people do, that personal connection, which then leads to them clicking on that link that uh, Wendy and her team have put out there on the internet. Um, and uh, I live here in DC, so I'll visit as well. <laughs> All right. Hi. Hi, really good to be here. I'm Charlotte Golai Ritchie. I'm a senior vice president for advocacy, public policy, and government relations at Youth Build USA. And I want to thank those of you who are here who have worked with Youth Build programs. I know many of you have, several of you have. I'm accompanying Jamil Alexander, who is not only a Youth Build AmeriCorps graduate, but also Youth Build AmeriCorps staff. He introduced himself to you. I have had a personal commitment to service, having been a Peace Corps volunteer, having served in uh, Kenya, Asante Sana, for your comments. But I think an important message that we should add to the many messages that I think we are collecting here today is this. Mm -hmm. And that while we all get a lot, it's very gratifying to be a service provider. And we believe that those we have connected with have benefited from our services. It's important for those we are connecting with to become service providers themselves, isn't it? Yeah. And it is very uplifting and rewarding to find that AmeriCorps has welcomed a cadre of young people who come from 
quote unquote disadvantaged communities, low income backgrounds and so on, who now are standing up as volunteers and leaders in their community. And what AmeriCorps has done is to open doors so these young people or older people, whatever age, now are leaders in their community. Jamil is a mayoral appointee to a commission that determines what kind of economic development choices the city makes in York, Pennsylvania. There's so many wonderful stories like that, and I just want to say thank you for the good work. Thank you, Wendy Spencer. Absolutely. Hi, my name is Samar Chatterjee, and since you are an ex Peace Corps, I wanted to address a question rather than talk about my service experience, which came many, many years ago through AmeriCorps, and uh, uh, that now I serve my church as well as, as a Peace Foundation uh, called Safe Foundation, uh, urging Americans, trying to educate Americans that there is a need for peace and less of military uh, activities. And I'm sure we want to help those who have, who have fought for democracy elsewhere to be rehabilitated. But at the same time, uh, what I would like to ask you is how we could teach the Americans through a message um, uh, that just as federal government needs to be involved in supporting activities abroad through military and Peace Corps, similarly, there is a need to serve the American people who are in need because I worked with homeless people and so on. I know there's a great need. And so there is equally a good need for federal government to be involved. And I understand that was a question that some people feel that uh, in this country, particularly the right wing, that AmeriCorps may not be needed. But it is as much needed as other uh, federal activities of helping abroad or doing things abroad. I, um, this, is a, this is obviously something we spend a lot of time thinking about. How do you connect people with so much going on in everyone's day-to-day -day life? Um, the president and the first lady who personally believe that national service, service in your community, at all the levels we're talking about is so crucial, both for individuals, uh, education and, and life, but just to move our countries forward. They firmly believe that. And they have a role to play and are playing in lifting that up, whether it's the First Lady's Joining Forces program, uh, whether it's the President and the First Lady just as an example. So I think there's a role they can play. But what we see time and time and time again is that the message only works and, and the call to action only happens when you have the combination of their leadership role combined with people hearing the personal stories of those they know. There's just nothing more powerful than that example. Um, I was the first Peace Corps volunteer ever to come out of the high school in rural western Wisconsin uh, that I went to. And since um, I went back to my high school a number of times, back to my university, uh, to talk about that experience, um, I, I think particularly when we talk about um, uh, dif disadvantaged youth, as you had talked about, that example that someone um, that came from their background, from their community, can do it. Nothing is more, uh, the combination of that with a, a, the leadership from the top levels, that's what works. And, and it can be difficult sometimes um, in day to day, every, you know, and our friends tell us they're sick of hearing our stories of AmeriCorps and Peace Corps. And um, it can be difficult to see the connection sometimes, but know that it works. Know that, in fact, it's not an additional thing, it's not an extra thing. It is the number one way that uh, telling your story is the number one way we get more people involved, person by person. Hi, um, my name is Sharon Wagner, um, and I did NCCC in 1999 to 2000. I was stationed in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh. Um, one of, <laughs> uh, when you talk about connections, one of the things that comes to mind is um, we did a project for two months in Anniston, Alabama, where we helped uh, lead college students to do Habitat for Humanity. And in that time, we learned so many different skills in, t in terms of um, home construction that we were able to go to Bay St. Louis, Mississippi and renovate a shelter for abused children. And I found out about five years later that that shelter, because we, we would keep in touch with the director of that, of that shelter and send donations every year as a team. And I found out in 2005 that it was one of the few um, buildings left standing in the area after Katrina. Oh. 
Um, so that was such a profound moment in my life. And then also, when you talk about connections, um, now I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maine, and I always tell my students, when they come to ask, you know, what should I do after I graduate, most people are telling them that they should seek out graduate school or something like that, and I am always, go into AmeriCorps. Whatever program <laughs> you do, um, it's gonna be worthwhile, and it'll change your life, and you'll learn something that you didn't know before. Um, so I'm very excited about passing that on to the students that uh, I serve now, and also it, it affects my research as well because I'm a professor I, that studies renewable energy, and you wouldn't necessarily think about it, but in my work I do, I, I'm trying to connect with the community about that because you talk about people not knowing about AmeriCorps or other programs are out there and, and people probably know less about energy, even just energy in general, but renewable energy for sure and, and what they can do on their, own, on their own homes and in their lives to improve the energy that we use. Um, so my, my work kind of focuses on engaging with the community about, about how we can better the future for renewable energy. Well, well first of all, good job on that uh, shelter. Uh, um, second, I will just tell you from my vantage point, um, education is incredibly important. I, I think uh, getting that master's degree, that MBA um, is crucial. But I will tell you, in my experience, both in government and elsewhere, when people are sitting at the table who've had the hammer in their hands, who've done the work at the local level, it makes such a difference. Because I, I, uh, my undergrad degree was civil engineering, and I learned how to pour concrete and how to build bridges. But if I could change one thing about the curriculum is we should have had a whole class on sitting in on city council meetings. Because as AmeriCorps <laughs> alumni, you understand it's not just having the plans, it's not just having the budget. You have to get people to work through what people go through to get stuff done. And, and I can only imagine in the renewable energy sector, again, it's just not how many panels do you need, it's how you're gonna get the homeowners association to be okay with putting them on people's roofs. The experience you bring to this, from where I sit now to where I've sat before, it is such a difference in being able to bring a team together that knows actually not just how to have an idea, but how to get it done. All right, yes. Good morning, my name is Julie Murphy and I'm a, with Points of Light um, and I'm a Vista alum, 1980, served in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I actually wanna actually have us look back actually mm -hmm. and begin to connect those like me who served a long time ago, who now have children who are going into high school, going into college. And I had this weekend an experience of going back to rural Georgia and one of my, someone asked me, they said, will AmeriCorps be around? Is it gonna survive? And that's part of what I do for my daily work is, is to talk about and, and advocate for AmeriCorps. And I said it will, and it should. And, I'll, and, I, and I think part of what we need to do as a movement is, is connect to AmeriCorps alums, connect your parents and your grandparents, and, and let them know that this is a program we want to continue, uh, that it, it is, these stories are incredible. Um, and I do think that we need to bring this, this out beyond just talking to ourselves, and I do think one way to do that, as we talked about the mommy blog, is to begin to get out outside our circles, and I encourage everybody to use AmeriCorps alums to connect, to build these stories, to tell the story, because I do think it's all, like Wendy said, anytime you turn around, folks you wouldn't think would even know about this are thinking, oh, that, that kid, that kid was in AmeriCorps, or that kid went to college because he got an educational award, never would have been to college otherwise. And again, it's, it's just, it's, we're, I think we're at a tipping point, and I just think it needs to go again to that next level. And I encourage you to reach out to those of us, again, who benefited a long time ago from this incredible program and still care deeply about it. Well, um, first of all, I, I have no doubt AmeriCorps is here to stay. And I promise you, as long as this president's here, he will be defending it and promoting it and expanding it like he has the last four years. But I'm also not worried because what we saw when there were those who proposed zeroing out that budget, what it was was people across the country explaining what it meant locally. It didn't mean anything to say we're zeroing out some agency you've never heard of, but when the question was, people have proposed taking away a third of the Red Cross volunteers here in Peoria, Illinois. When it got to that level, we won the debate quite quickly. Um, as a former Peace Corps volunteer, uh, our community, it sounds like I've got a few fellow R RCPVs here, um, we were all a little jealous that AmeriCorps surpassed us in alums, what, after just like eight years or something. There's about a quarter million of us and a million of you, and just 
seeing the connectedness and the network that those quarter million uh, returned Peace Corps volunteers are. Um, I served with people who were the kids of moms and dads who met in the Peace Corps in the 1960s and 70s. Um, AmeriCorps alum are gonna take over the country in just a few more years, I think. <laughs> well, um, I, uh, I now have the privilege, of, so you've heard all my Peace Corps stories. Um, I, I now have the privilege of introducing someone here at the White House who has an even more connected story to tell. And I think it's a good transition because, you know, one thing we've talked about is the power of personal stories and connections. But what's so fantastic about today is that those personal connections, your megaphone is so much bigger. Um, you know, I heard the stories of people who served in the Peace Corps when they were all leaving. They had to give each other their parents' home numbers because they didn't know where they were moving to and how you'd reach them. And now, uh, you know, we had a Facebook group set up by the time I uh, was on the plane uh, back to the United States. So to me, what is so exciting is that power of personal stories, power of connections amplified with the digital age. And we spend a lot of time thinking about that uh, here at the White House and, and how to connect people and use those personal stories and use that uh, brand new megaphone that we have. Uh, and I'm very uh, excited to welcome up here to the stage an AmeriCorps alum and the guy who's in charge of digital strategies here at the White House, Macon Phillips. All right. Thanks, John. And I'm just going to take a few minutes. I know you've, uh, we're wrapping up the session, but um, I wanted to come here and just share my own story. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you guys have them about me or about the work that we do here. Um, but one of the things that um, I think I I've heard a lot just kind of listening in from the side is uh, the phrase that AmeriCorps changed my life. And it couldn't be more true uh, for me. And when people talk to me about my AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps VISTA experience, I should say, Yes, that's right. This is? There we go. And I should, as, before I get into this, I should just thank you for giving me an excuse not to wear an, a, a suit for about 30 minutes today. In fact, my wife won't even let me wear this t-shirt anymore because you can kind of see through it, but um, it's my favorite t-shirt. Uh, it's 10 years old. So 10 years ago, um, I was living in California. I just graduated from college in 2000. And unlike many of my friends in college who went on to Wall Street to sell mortgage bonds or whatever they ended up selling. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And uh, you know, like any 21-year-old uh, uh, boy right out of college, I decided to move to Irvine, California, where I planted my roots and spent a year there, a year in San Francisco. And at a certain point in time, I realized I had uh, two choices, I, or three choices, really. I, I could keep screwing around in San Francisco, and, and I was doing a pretty good job at that. Um, <laughs> I could go to law school which is what my dad wanted me to do, which would have been probably a good move, but as I've heard from people who've gone to law school, if your heart isn't into it, it is a disaster. Um, and I didn't realize I had this third option until I went to uh, my college um, uh, job board when I was living at home in Alabama shucking oysters trying to figure out what I was going to do. You know, we've all had those months, I guess. Um, <laughs> and I tried to figure out what, like, what I want to spend my time doing. And, um, you know, I... Uh, I had never heard of AmeriCorps, and in fact, I found this job in Vermont. Uh, I didn't even know it was an AmeriCorps job. Um, I just talked to the guys that were running it, how to be funded by AmeriCorps, and uh, right at the end of the conversation with them, they said, oh, by the way, there's a lot of paperwork you have to fill out because this position's funded uh, with federal dollars and so forth. Not that funded, by the way, right, as you know. <laughs> right? That's one of the lessons people don't like to, like to talk about, is like what it's like to live on 10 grand a year. It's like. <laughs> That in and of itself is eye-opening, but anyway. Um, you know, I, so I, I jumped in my truck and I moved to Vermont and began an experience that did change my life. Um, I, I'm not from a very wealthy household, but I didn't really want much growing up. I went to college. I didn't have to take out a lot of loans. Um, I had a life that was very comfortable. My parents worked really hard for that. And living in northern Alabama, I didn't really spend a lot of time with people who weren't like me. And moving to Vermont and working in a program that basically matched up uh, college students, started at Dartmouth, and we, uh, we expanded to UVM, uh, to St. Mike's, a few other schools, with children in no low-income housing communities that were nearby. We ran a mentoring program there. Spending times in these housing developments, um, there's a lot of cliches you could say, but I, I guess at the very baseline, it was exposing me to people that weren't, weren't like me. And it was making me realize that a lot of people are born into this world without the sort of um, opportunities and comforts that I enjoyed. And 
I actually felt pretty dumb being 22 and realizing that for the first time. 23, realizing that for the first time. But it, uh, it lit a spark in me. And uh, I chose to sort of take that spark in one direction. I got into politics. Other people, it's interesting, I was just thinking about all the people that I served with. There's a woman I worked with, an amazing lawyer in, in Maryland who now works with poorest families in Maryland. She went on to law school, incredibly intelligent woman. She decided she just wanted to go back into practice and help kids. Another guy who's in San Francisco started a technology firm there, just focused on internet, or started with the focus on international nonprofits. So trying to figure out how he can actually build tools that help kids um, who aren't doing too well in other countries. Another guy went to graduate school to get his, MF, or his uh, MPA and is now doing consulting work for nonprofits in Boston. Another went to business school to try to figure out how to apply those models back to the nonprofits and, and, and the, the issues he had struggled with when he was running Dream. I mean, the list goes on and on. No one I worked with was like, well, I, I put in my time, now I get to go be a jerk, you know? Because <laughs> like, I mean, you, could, you could make that argument, but like no one does, right? And, and, and it's really amazing. For me, I, um, you know, I got involved in politics, and, and 10 years ago, I got this t-shirt, and, and, and now I'm getting to talk to you here at the White House. And a big part of that story, obviously, is, is uh, President Obama. And one of the quotes that, you know, it's, it's a very well known when we, in fact, we had it at the top of our website during the, uh, during the 2008 campaign, um, went something like, I'm, I'm not asking you to believe in me, I'm asking you to believe in yourself. And to me, that's what particularly the AmeriCorps VISTA experience was like for me. You know, we explained VISTA as, you know, we're not the tutors in the schools, we're the programs that actually schedule the tutors and find them and make sure the next semester is going to be more tutors and next semester is going to be more tutors. We were building capacity. You know, we weren't actually the front line of service. We were the capacity for service. And we would help take these ideas that these amazing people had, these founders of these nonprofits, and we would jump into them and help build it up into something bigger. And I've taken that lesson uh, as we've gotten into politics, as we've run a campaign that's all about empowering people, building something bigger than yourself. And I've taken that lesson here in the government to realize the role the government has isn't about government doing things for people. It's about government creating the capacity and the opportunity for people to help one another. To me, that's, that's the lesson I took away from AmeriCorps. And it's a lesson that I, I couldn't share loudly enough and, and frequently enough. It's something I'll, I'll keep uh, until my last day. I, I, I remember some, uh, I just heard somebody talk about how uh, she's thinking about her kids going to AmeriCorps instead of you know, taking a year off or going to graduate school. That's absolutely going to be something that uh, I, I ask my kids uh, to, to really consider. I wish I had taken the year off before I went to college, but I didn't. And we can talk about college some other time. <laughs> um, but you know, for me, being exposed to people who are different than you, Learning that it's not about what you do, it's what you, the, you create the capacity for all of us to do. Those were the two things that I took away from my experiences at Vista. Uh, and it, nothing makes me more excited than to realize that right now at this moment, around this country, there are thousands, thousands of young people, and not so young people, in AmeriCorps learning those same lessons. Because we could all stand to kind of remember that, make sure we share that with everyone we know. So, to all of you and your amazing work that you've done, I just want to say thank you. I want to say welcome to the White House and know that you've got a Vista here rocking it out every day for you. Thank you. All right. Unless there's any, like, scorching questions, I think we're going to wrap this up. Everybody good? No questions? Or one from the back? Okay. Right. Oh, yeah, you know, I should give a plug to these guys, right? I'm sure. Sorry uh, on the live stream. I know Mike. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> Dreamprogram.org. It is a great mentoring program founded in, uh, uh, at, at Dartmouth uh, uh, and uh, is now based out of Burlington. And it basically has started growing, and, and it's, it's uh, catching when we've expanded to Boston. They come down here to, to D.C. Uh, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing program. So check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Also, what can we 
Well, so I'll say, I think there's a few points to that. The first is, in terms of the professional development standpoint, when I became an AmeriCorps VISTA, I got more responsibility than I ever deserved. <laughs> I mean, right? And so, I mean, and it's, if, you, if you sink or swim, and if you sink, I mean, that's unfortunate, but if you swim, I mean, that is great stuff, you know? And by the end of your experience, you're doing things you never thought were possible. So, you know, you can go, you can join the corporate ladder, and it's probably more secure, and, and if you, you know, I, I, you know, you probably have a more comfortable life, but the, the curve <laughs> isn't as steep as if you catch a flyer in, in a program like, like AmeriCorps. If you find the right opportunity, there, there's, not, there's, there's no lack of work to be done. They'll just keep dumping it on you, and you'll just start realizing you got muscles you never realized you had. So from professional development, that's, that's one thing. I would say from a social media standpoint, uh, the fact that the alumni network is, so, is, is already so strong, even as these tools are really just becoming, um, I think, uh, sort of de rigueur of all these or organizational management approaches, uh, is really exciting. The, the, um, I think the network of AmeriCorps around the country is something that uh, can be incredibly helpful for recruiting new members uh, and for supporting members as they're working. Um, uh, and, and I'm really excited to see sort of where that goes. But just from a basic storytelling, you know, there's a, I have, you know, it's 10 years ago I was working for a nonprofit. And I think we always struggled to get the word out about what we were doing at the very basic level. Um, and I'm optimistic about what sort of self-publishing and social media offers these smaller nonprofits because they can actually just get their story out and if they're compelling enough, it gets shared. They don't have to wait for a newspaper uh, to cover them or for a, a television anchor to come, a television reporter to come cover them. Um, but you, gotta, you just got to keep at it. And uh, one of the things that I think is really powerful about the AmeriCorps experience is it is sort of a, uh, for me, it was a year long. And to be able to chronicle that, you know, if there was a way that you could collect all the different types of stories that are happening around the country uh, in a way that people could follow, follow progress, give updates, feel like they have a relationship with the people who are doing work on the ground, I think you'll find that there's a lot of people in this country who can't sacrifice the year, who can't sacrifice six months or the money to go do this, but they want to help in some other way. And if you can give them an opportunity to have a relationship with the people who can, you've got something that's pretty powerful. Okay? Anything else? Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. See you.